welcome. Um, uh, I'm glad you found your way here back to the tomb. Uh, again, my name is Christy. For those of you who might be just now joining us for the afternoon, my name is Christy Weininger. I am the executive director of the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Library and Museums, and it is my honor to welcome all of you and some special guests who are going to participate in our replaying ceremony. Um, we have Brigadier General John M. Dreska, who is returning for uh, the second year. Uh, General Dreska uh, and I had a wonderful tour of the museum. He's um, such an excellent student of history, knows a lot about history. We're glad to have him back this year. Um, he is the commanding general of the 311th Sustainment Command Expeditionary uh, that operates out of Los Angeles, California. We also have Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel Timothy Stansberry who's from the 807th Medical Command uh, Deployment Support. We also have Army Reserve Ambassador Ralph Beppers, <laughs> um, who's a retired Command Sergeant Major, CSM. Our bugler this afternoon is Staff Sergeant Luke Washburn, who's from the 338th Army Reserve Band. We also have members of MALIS, the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States. Uh, Rob Rock will be laying that wreath. Um, we also have members of the Hayes family, Jen McFarland Barrett, who you heard from uh, in the ceremony on the veranda. She is our board president, and uh, she will be laying the wreath with John Hayes, um, who is a cousin of uh, President Hayes's. And by the way, his wife Sue made the wreath here that the Hayes family is going to place at the, at the tomb. Um, I'm also so uh, pleased to have our color guard here this afternoon uh, and composing our color guard is the Fremont VFW Post 2947, Fremont American Legion Post 608, Clyde VFW Post 3343, the PFC Russell Moop Detachment Marine Corps League, and the Sandusky County AMVETS Post 67. And uh, concluding our ceremony will also be uh, jo our very own Joan Eckerman, uh, who will be performing a beautiful uh, vocal solo of, of a hymn. And uh, I will uh, explain a little more detail about that when we get to that part of our ceremony. So now we will have our invocation. If you would, please join with me in prayer. Almighty God, we are grateful for the abundance you have provided our land so that we become a great nation. May the faith, service, and love that strengthen their forefathers also inspire us that we may serve the needs of our day as they did in their time. And so today we honor the memory of President Hayes by our commitment to his principles of freedom peace, justice, and love for this country. Amen. Amen. Greetings. My name is uh, John Dreska. I live in Columbus, Ohio, uh, and my soldiers and my units are out in Los Angeles, California, Riverside, California, Arizona, and Nevada. And it is an honor and a privilege to be with you today. Uh, it is absolutely gorgeous in Spiegel Grove. I spent last weekend at the National Training Center in Fort Irwin, California, out in the Mojave Desert. There was no green for a thousand miles. It was unbelievable. So it is just wonderful to be here with you. And hopefully you understand uh, my words about service that I'm gonna talk about with President Hayes here. So, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct privilege to serve as the official representative of the President of the United States on this occasion of the 200th anniversary of the birth of President Rutherford B. Hayes. I can't think of a better way to kick off the celebration of 200 years than to do so at this historic site and with such wonderful Americans. The accomplishments he achieved as a private citizen a soldier, a congressman, a governor, and ultimately as president of the United States are an extraordinary roadmap to selfless service. When our nation was at a crossroads, he volunteered to serve. 
first with this local outfit and later as a member of the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment. President Hayes referred to his military service during the Civil War years as his golden years. During this time, he rose to the rank of Brevet Major General and was wounded in the Union victory at South Mountain in Maryland. Being wounded in Civil War times was often a guarantee of amputation, paralysis, or death. War is ne never something we should take lightly. It should always be the means of la the last means of resort. But when we go to war, we have to be all in, and we must have the American public behind the soldiers and the military members every step of the way. President Hayes was a leader that absolutely understood the importance of diplomacy and that war should never be chosen unless it is absolutely necessary. Born in Delaware, Ohio, and on October 4th in 1822, he was raised by his mother, Sophia, and his uncle, Sardis Corchard. At the age of 12, President Hayes began to keep a diary, which was something he continued through the rest of his life. When reflecting on his life and service to the nation, he once wrote, My best reflection is that a life spent in duty must be well spent. Whose sense of duty is it to determine? Live according to your own conscience. In my mind, this meant that there was no greater deed that could have been done other than to serve one's country. President Hayes put service to his country above all things in life. He was proud of his public service and he wanted others to experience this pride for themselves. His legacy as a soldier is well documented. He was a confident leader with the ability to inspire his men through example. President Hayes said of his decision to volunteer for military service, I would prefer to go into it if I knew I was to be killed than to live through it without taking any part. President Hayes was about such selfless service. He would rather be killed in war fighting for his country with his fellow soldiers then serve and miss the opportunity to defend this nation in combat. In essence, nobody wants to die in war, but if it is meant that he had to, there would be no greater honor than fighting and dying for one's country or with one's fellow soldiers by his side. 29 years ago tomorrow, in, in this same spirit, I witnessed two men volunteer to sacrifice their lives in order to save the life of one man. Sergeant First Class Randy Shugart and Master Sergeant Gary Gordon sacrificed themselves to save the life of Chief Warrant Officer Michael Durant in Mogadishu, Somalia during Black Hawk Down. They saved Chief Durant, but they both died in doing so. As a platoon leader going through that incident, my soldiers recovered the remains of Shugart and Gordon. I saw with my own eyes what heroism and selfless service to the nation and my fellow Americans was about. I'm humbled to have been in the presence of such great warriors. This spirit is what President Hayes brought to the office of the presidency and to our nation. While still in the Union Army, Hayes was nominated for the House of Representatives from Ohio's second district. He was elected without ever leaving his men as he refused to take his seat in Congress until the fighting was over in 1865. This is what true leadership is really about. This was leading from the front. Hayes later served two highly successful terms as governor before returning here to Fremont and devoting himself to his private law practice. In 1875, at the insistence of his state party, Hayes agreed to run for governor of Ohio for a third time. His victory made him a national figure and a front runner for the next Republican presidential nomination. Had his life of service and political career stopped there, we might not be standing here today honoring the legacy he left our country, but the presidency had awaited. Following a highly contested election, Hayes was elected the 19th president of the United States. As president, he championed civil service reform, supported hard money policies, and worked to reconcile the North and South in the end of Reconstruction. His honesty and integrity revived the prestige of the presidential office. Throughout his years of war, political service, and as president, Rutherford B. Hayes remained honest, optimistic, 
and decisive. He knew the power of compromise and worked tirelessly for fairness and equity for all of our country's citizens. To honor his memory, the Hayes family established the first residential library here in Chief Grove, more than a century ago. The library preserved President Hayes' 12,000 volume personal collection, along with the material from his military and political career, particularly his presidency. The museum is a walk through history and a reflection of the life of the service of which he led. President Hayes not only left a tangible legacy in his words, but he left a true and lasting legacy to humanity by serving a cause greater than his own. Thank you for joining me here today in commemorating the life and legacy of President Rutherford B. Hayes. On behalf of the President of the United States, I thank you for your commitment to this honored tradition. God bless you, all of our families and friends, and our great United States of America. We will now place our first wreath. This one will be done by the Hayes family. So Jen and uh, John, please come, up, come forward. from the Military Order, Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States, Ohio Commandery. General Dreska and thank you Ambassador Dos Santos. So I have a few brief remarks that I would like to make um, and I could not think of a better way to conclude our ceremony 
then by uh, ending with a few excerpts from the eulogy that Reverend Washington Gladden gave at Rutherford B. Hayes' memorial service, which was held in Columbus. And um, we've talked a little bit, Megan so eloquently addressed, why do we remember a man who was born 200 years ago? How does President Hayes' life connect to our modern lives? Um, and I could not frame it any better than the way Reverend Gladden does. So when Rutherford passed away, he died here at Spiegel Grove in January of 1893, and his funeral was held here, but there was also a memorial service in Columbus. And the person who was asked to give that eulogy, Reverend Washington Gladden, was a great friend of Rutherford Hayes's. Although they had some differences, um, Gladden was a uh, minister in Columbus. He ran for uh, city council of Columbus, so he was a politician like President Hayes. Um, but uh, of course, devoutly religious. And while Rutherford um, had definitely uh, had uh, religious views that very much supported his wife, Lucy, Rutherford, in fact, never really joined a church. Um, and so they differed there, but they did not let them get, let that get in the way of a really amazing friendship. Philosophically, uh, they really connected. And um, in President Hayes's later years, he became very active in a number of social causes, and that's how he crossed paths with Washington Gladden. So um, I have condensed, again, Washington Gladden's uh, eulogy but I hope that you take these words and reflect upon these words and think about um, what Rutherford Hayes' life can mean to all of us today. So I share with you now the uh, words of Washington Gladden. I have named him the great commoner. From the common people, Rutherford Hayes rose and he never rose above them. That persistent determination of his to walk in the ranks of the Grand Army Parades has been censured by some as affectation, just for show. But for President Hayes, it was the simple expression of the fact, which he would neither deny nor ignore. He was a plain citizen, nothing more. While he was the chief magistrate of the nation, he magnified the office, and when he laid it down, he returned to his place. He knew the dignity of his office. He knew also the dignity of private citizenship. When the future historian comes to test by the standards of impartial criticism, the characters and the services of the men of Ohio who have been at the front of the 19th century, I think that the name of Rutherford Burchard Hayes will lead all the rest. Grant and Sherman and Sheridan were greater generals. Garfield was a greater genius. And there have been greater orators and greater jurists and greater educators. But take him all in all for an all round man, citizen, soldier, statesman, scholar, man of books, man of brains, man of affairs, husband, father, philanthropist, neighbor, friend. There is not another who will measure quite as large as the good man who has just gone. For many months, the result of the 1876 election was left in doubt, and party passion was so inflamed that there was a danger of revolution. Opinions formed under such cir circumstances are not apt to be judicial, and is, it is not easy for men on one side to get the point of view of their opponents. The reins of government were placed in Rutherford's hands at a time of the greatest difficulty. Every influence was hostile. The country greatly was agitated by antagonisms and alarms. President Hayes carried forward in his administration and he won the confidence of the whole American people. The patriotism of General Hayes was love of country, of the whole country, not of any section, though he was proud of his own commonwealth, not of any party, though he was a loyal Republican, but of the whole land, the whole people. There are plenty of men to whom patriotism is a mere sentiment. The only motive that really moves them in public affairs is love of party. To that, their real loyalty is given. Their conduct abundantly shows that they would rather see their country suffer loss at the hands of their own party than prosper in the hands of their opponents. The other party they count is their enemy. It is the word by which they uniformly speak of it. 
and it is the conception under which they always think it. The other half of their fellow, fellow citizens are practically aliens. Now this is not the spirit of patriotism. No thoroughgoing partisan can claim to be a patriot. He is a kind of semi-patriot, a lover of half his country. It is in this determination to keep the claims of party subordinate to the interests of the whole public that I discern the keynote of President Hayes' patriotism. That famous, famous phrase of his inaugural address in 1877, he serves his party best, who serves his country best. And Glenn, Glenn shares some of the joint projects that he and Rutherford Hayes have worked on. And he recalls a moment when President Hayes was pausing on the threshold of his study, Gladden says, relating what Hayes says, I thought, said President Hayes, that when I laid down my official cares, I should have a tolerably easy life, but I have been kept about as busy for the last 10 years working for other people as I ever was in my life, and I don't de deny that I enjoy it. Back to Gladden's words. It is not easy to convince our hearts that this good friend of ours is not to be seen among us again. He was wont to come frequently. It was good to hear of his arrival. It was pleasant to meet him on the street. And there was always a little more courage for work after we had looked for a moment in his face. Here was a man, we said to ourselves, who has lived. What an answer to his life is the plea of the mercenary politician that success is impossible to the unselfish patriot. Who among these schemers and tricksters will ever reach the height on which this man stood? Who never sold the truth to serve the hour, nor paltered with the eternal God for power. President Hayes was reticent, I judge, about his religious experience. I do not know that he formulated for himself any creed. He was content, probably, with a very short state of some of the fundamental truths of religion. He asked me not long ago if I knew a certain minister of our own communion. I replied that I'd known him since our seminary days. Well, he said, I heard him preach last Sunday, and it was a very fine sermon. You know, Hayes added with a humorous twinkle, we always think that a man who agrees with us is an able man. <laughs> but the text of the sermon was a striking one. The second is like unto it. That was all there was in the text, but it was enough, I assure you, to furnish the foundation of a very strong discourse, said President Hayes. I could easily believe it. The second is like unto it, equal to it. It is what our master says about the second great commandment of the law. The first great commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. The second is like unto it, equally binding, equally fundamental, equally religious. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So there were two hymns sung at President Hayes' funeral. One was, God be with us till we meet again. The other was, It is well with my soul, which incidentally was written in 1876, the year that Hayes ran for President of the United States. So to close out our ceremony this afternoon, Joan is going to sing that hymn for us. <laughs>
That was beautiful, Joan. Thank you. So that concludes our ceremony. Happy birthday to President Hayes. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. And now we have cake. <laughs>